Now I'd like to uh, welcome Henning Dietrich, who will be doing the opening keynote, which is Towards a Democracy of Devices. Welcome, Henning. Okay, so I'm Henning Dietrich, I'm from IBM. I'm working blockchain stuff there. Uh, different, uh, pretty uh, deep technical things. And uh, for this talk though, I'm trying to give a primer in a non-technical way, uh, shunning all the stuff that uh, we're actually um, juicing each other with um, uh, in, the, in the workshops, for example and to try to um, make, uh, give, give a good idea what uh, this really means. Uh, smart cities, smart contracts, blockchain, and some other um, buzzwords that you might have heard. Thanks a lot for having us. Hong Kong is really fascinating. Um, this is a bit of a flying circus, um, the workshops that we're having here, and I can say that being here in Hong Kong is uh, no less impressive than being at Stanford or London. Um, I'm really so positively surprised. And, this great hospitality extended here to us. Thank you very much for that. So, um, if we talk about smart cities, then maybe it's good to start the conversation um, from the goals. Who are the smart citizens that we are actually building for? And what is smart here? How do we ground the possibilities of technology with what people actually want and need to, need to lead better lives? To me, cities actually have something scary. All of us. All the windows, and these are windows in Berlin, or could be in Berlin, where I come from. They scare me. Who lives behind those windows? Is there even anybody living there? Isn't there enough space even out on the streets if anybody, if everybody would come out of the houses and be in the street at the same time? And Am I the only one asking that question, or is that coming from something that's not even personal and that many people might be sharing? I was born in Berlin when it was actually quite empty because of the Cold War. Many people had left because it was dangerous. And from my father's side, I'm a first generation urban citizen. My father was a soldier's son, and his father was the son of the baker in a little village. And life is very different in a small village. You know people. And I also discovered, searching for my own sense of place, that the only place where I really actually feel at home is at sea, with no land at the horizon. And it's actually the water that makes Hong Kong so beautiful to me. But the city as we have today is not inherently a likable place. There are often no means for that right now. Most of our forefathers moved to the city to evade poverty, or because they had to sell their land or did not inherit any. In Hong Kong especially, one revolution and rapid industrialization drove people here in giant projects where the blessing that got them out of the shanty towns that they first built. But we are not far removed from a life form in the city where it was all about survival. And that's what city life often looks like. That people may not know what they miss doesn't really make it less of a loss. I never lived in a village. That we are in a rat race, that we never have time, that we miss something, that something is off. I hear that sentiment shared quite often. What I find missing in cities is usually the sense of place. And Hong Kong is almost an exception here because of the water and the hills. It is way more defined by nature than most cities. 
But often everything in a city is fabricated, not grown. Sometimes you don't see anything other than man-made um, that could be anywhere on the globe. Everything outgrow of an investment decision, or government planning, or corporate design. People are deprived of the expression of what they shape their environment into. Instead, it is being shaped for them, and concrete resists tempering. The cities we build are man-made, but are they made for men? There's one very strong exception to me, with that lack of place in cities, and that's the Athens Acropolis. This for me is really a place. Standing up there, you have this very strong sense of place. Maybe in part because I visited there when I was young with my family, and I recall how my father haggled with a fruit seller, and he insisted to have that fruit that he was playing on, and I still have it. But looking down from the Acropolis into the hills and into the city around it gives you a massive feeling of you are at a certain specific location, and not just somewhere. And what a place that is. Not only are the ruins around you a thousand years old, actually blown to pieces only quite recently when warfare became powerful enough to make that possible. But this is the place where democracy was first invented and practiced. It was unintentional, as with many great inventions. After some power plays, all of a sudden the real power rested with the elected body of Athens, although nobody had really meant it to end up there. And it worked quite well, for a bit. There was a highly centralized society that at some point demonstrated that it performed better in the essential metrics back then, war. But we don't praise much of Sparta's culture, except calling poor things euphemistically Spartan. While Athens is forever one with arts, philosophy, the rule of law, and democracy. We live in quite Spartan cities today. They foster anonymity rather than community. Through the use of space, they foster competition rather than union, loneliness rather than company, separation into individual family units rather than generations living together. They are the result of strong pressures, economic pressures, and time shortage. Who has time to commute to the countryside every day? Our cities, for most, are quite poor in time and in money. It all works like it is now, Spartan. Centralized, dictated by strong companies and authorities, but the blockchain will allow for a new way of interacting that re-establish possibilities we lost when we started to leave the village. It will not bring back the cozy aspects of village lives, or maybe it will, the essential values of it. So, when we talk about smart contracts, there are standard examples, like the fridge that refills itself with food when it realizes you're running low on something. The exciting possibility with blockchain is that you could have it have a budget of virtual currency and go out and shop the internet, buy the stuff and order it delivered all autonomously. I believe to be in the certainty that we will see self-driving, self-owning taxis who are small companies to themselves paying for the garage services and petrols themselves with some form of Bitcoin. We might have self-sufficient, fully self-owning hotel buildings, which control their employees via Yelp feedback and also are at the heart of it an autonomous corporation. And who then owns machines that no one owns? Maybe the profits will continue to concentrate in a few. Maybe they will be understood as common goods. Future traffic systems, superhighways, automatic vehicles, air lanes, we will see superhighways and drone traffic on invisible lanes zipping through the skies. And smart contracts will also play an enormous role to help negotiating rights of way for drones, for example, in real time, but also fares and what roads to build in the first place. We might see the personalized ads for Minority Report as huge as Blade Runner. Information can save lives, literally. Medical records, access controlled by the patient, but accessible from anywhere, will soon be viewed as indispensable as hygiene. 
And all this will shape how cities will look in the future. But that is not enough. So imagine two people making love. And they're quite ecstatic. And they want to come together because they feel that increases the likeliness of a child. Now usually that story is told as the story of two generals wanting to raid the city together. And I guess that's less controversial, so I tell that in that way, which says a lot about our condition of human culture. Can we get smart and make love, maybe? Not war. Can we all progress? Can we prosper? Can smart contracts help with that? But so it doesn't get embarrassing, I'll switch to those generals. Instead of making up a scenario where one of the lovers proposes being ready and whispers to the other but isn't sure if the other heard it or is just incapable of answering, and so the answer is demanded again, but it comes so silently that our lover is not sure what it meant, and ask again, and now it gets annoying already, and it's all over. And the point here is it's not easy to reach consensus. And it's really a blessing. Humans can look each other into the eyes and understand that they were understood. But computers don't have that. When two communicate, they can never know if the other got the message, or the message was maybe lost, or the other side crashed and rebooted blanks and sending an acknowledgement. Every acknowledgement of a message could also get lost, and this becomes a vicious circle from which, for computers, there is no escaping. They can, in fact, never know with any certainty that at any point in time they are truly in sync with another computer. There are only probabilities, and that's a very hard problem. It's called the Byzantine generals problem, and it plagues every distributed system. Many approaches have been designed and have been successful in tackling it, but it cannot be solved once and for all. Like quantum physics, once you have more than two processes, everything becomes a science of probability rather than solid facts. And that is, a, that is massively at odds with what you expect from computers. <laughs> now, it's quite interesting that it's not called the lover's problem, because in a way, loving and knowing each other is the way to overcome the existential notion that every man is an island. Computers will always fail at that. But now, it has the blockchain. And that comes pretty close. I believe we stand in front of something huge. It's so big we can't really see it, way bigger than the technological trick that makes it possible. It's hard to comprehend in two ways. For one, for its consequences that we will benefit to try to envision. And second, for its technical basics, where there are many misunderstandings around. And these misunderstandings are far spread and create an echo chamber. People try to get oriented, get wrong facts, get irritated, and there's no central authority to educate people. It's a very democratic process, very free and malleable, and everybody's entitled to have an opinion. So there's no one to call the quarks out, because anyone shooting could be a quark himself. There are few reputations established in this domain, Efforts like blockchain workshop, Koala, collaborations with academic research universities are trying to change that. There are the relative reputations where a big brand like IBM steps in the game and you hope the stuff they are saying and writing by their smart guys is something you can rely on. IBM is famous for infighting them. People protect their turf, people like to shoot messengers you don't know, you can trust. So what do you do? Process it all yourself. And by the way, that's exactly how the blockchain works. The blockchain doesn't solve the hand and egg problem itself. But the blockchain introduces something that we call trustless. That means no one can bullshit you and everyone else, everyone else makes sure in passing that you can't get fooled. This works only with hard facts. Hard facts that you can express digitally, like money, digitally signed deeds, contracts, goods, certificates. 
And all that while no one has to trust anybody else's words. And the trick is very simple. Everyone is, in fact, processing it all themselves. It's the equivalent of you learning all about a hard topic so you can know who tries to bullshit you. It's the least economic way to compute anything. All computers in your network, in a blockchain, do the exact same instead of complementing each other <coughs> with a shared workload. And to me, I think this is AI right there. It doesn't look as expected. It looks brute force-like. But the blockchain, for hard facts, make it impossible for anyone to fool you because you simply check every last bit of what the claim is by computing everything exactly the same way. And everybody else in the network does that too. And that's a blockchain. Now we've done that work together. We've synchronized our brains. And I, right in this moment, I'm proposing a logical conclusion step by step. And you, like another computer, process them and convince yourself that, in fact, the logic behind it is true. And then after me, the next speaker comes and proposes the next block of knowledge. Some transactions of insight. So that metaphor sounds surprisingly social then, right? It doesn't really feel trustless, but very communicative. But it also is really trustless in the sense that you aren't asked to believe my logic, but I have to make the case by laying out the building blocks. Now the blockchain has one big advantage. While rhetorics might be deceiving, the calculations in a blockchain are exact. There are no two opinions. Well, actually, there are no two opinions about the logic. The nodes of blockchains can be fooled about basic math. One and one is two. But if one node insists one and one was four, well, the result of that would simply be it would be ignored by all the other nodes. It kicks itself out of what's called the consensus. So every node checks what one and one is and finds it's two. And they disregard whatever was proposed based on the assumption that one and one was three. So here the analogy with human beings fails. The blockchain is based on math. And there's no additional type of green that could be defined. However, what can happen is that the network fails, and some nodes start talking among themselves, only over here, and some others over there, and they don't even realize the community has split. And that also ends the consensus among them. The one group will have consensus about what the truth is among themselves, and the other group hasn't even heard what they debated over in the other corner. Now, that can always happen. That's a huge problem. And we are in the middle of hot research this year of what to do there. There are accepted ways to do it now. Bitcoin propo proposed an ingenious way, and that's what makes it a success. But it's far from a perfect solution. In fact, it can lead to very poor results sometimes. And I won't go deeper at this point, but I will say that there are problems that are not solved yet. And I have yet to be convinced of an approach that will work. I've also been in situations where that is regarded in implementation detail. Well, it isn't. That's like saying we really know we want fusion reactions to solve our energy challenges. And we have the smartest minds working in it, so it will happen soon, since a couple of decades. But while there's overreach, let's look at what we have and why I think this could be called AI. There's the term AI effect, and it means that we have this ungrateful habit of denying anything the label of AI that actually exists. We feel we'd know AI if we met it, but nothing we have now passes that test. And what is really playing out is that there's a bias that AI is science fiction, and nothing that really exists could possibly also be science fiction, right? But I think it's important to appreciate the rainbow shine of CDs and the blue glow of a reactor blast. This stuff really looks and works like you thought it should. Science fiction come real. And I think that's not celebrated. And what we have here with the blockchain is something that would have been impossible to achieve only 10 years ago. Computers were just not fast enough, at least consumer computers. The concept is inherently wasteful, which means it will only get stronger while computers get, keep getting more powerful. And we just didn't have the hardware to run it earlier. So while it could have been invented earlier, it would not have been possible to run it. 
is not like a melody that could have been invented and sung any time in, his, in the history of mankind. It's really only right now. But the heart of the matter is what we see here is an emergent feature, and one that is modeled pretty closely on how human brains work. Not one brain, but many brains in concert. And who thinks you could grow up to be sane-minded without the social fabric of other minds around you. It has been tried. The children died. So this network of electronic processors, the blockchain, mimics something else that we expected to create intelligence. It doesn't deal with becoming the self-aware single brain. It aids the way we synchronize with our environment, the minds around us, and from that, we don't get self-awareness as holy grail, but we get something else. So let's play chess. What would we logically come to expect what we should get when we successfully model one special aspect of the mind, namely the way how it checks if it's being told the truth or not? That part where you think something thought through yourself to find a you route. And again, you might lose the picture now because it seems so simple. But that is what the blockchain is, and it is new. IBM mainframes and space shuttles did something similar, where they were more or less just constantly second-guessing themselves, not controlling what someone else fed them. In the blockchain, that is what happens. It controls if it's told the truth. Now, what you get is something that can be fooled, paired with the exactitude of a computer that knows basically only zeros and ones, and not ever one and a half, and that is important. We, as human beings, usually talk about interesting things, or try to. Computers are bookkeepers. And the AI we're talking about here is not the philosophical sample we're type, but it is one that can be fooled and good for finance, or in content, but unfoolable. That's that. You get a computer that is still primitive in what it can do, but it cannot be fed wrong information. That is actually mind-boggling, and it's about to put a lot of professions out of business. And that is leveraged for commerce, just like the internet revolutionized the media industry. So the blockchain is a method to get computers to agree. This is a very hard problem, and the blockchain solves this initially giving us virtual currency, independent of any bank or government. Since money is around for quite a bit, and it has the most profound impact on our societies, that is something. We can expect that this new evolution of it, of money, will have far-reaching consequences. Or can we? Will it be all co-opted by banks? Or governments? Can it be co-opted at all? For individual profit or shared prosperity? There are multiple successful local currencies through the ages, up to modern times, usually after the collapse of central government. But the central authority ended them as fast as it regained the power. Will Bitcoin go the same way? That is possible. But it doesn't matter. Because the automatic intelligence we have found in its basic principles is useful for many things in commerce beyond payment and cryptocurrency. However, and that is important in part of this, having cryptocurrency in the mix makes commerce founded on blockchain really powerful. People try to wiggle around it because they don't want to be associated with the dirt of Bitcoin, with the shadiness associated with the term cryptocurrency. So the stuff is called virtual currency or digital assets, <coughs> but those are fig leaves. You either have cryptocurrency with your smart contracts, or you have neutered the whole concept. Just trust me on that. For the sake of brevity, I won't go into this here, this would not be a valid transaction on the blockchain then. But at this point, a problem to the blockchain also has comes into play. To provide trustlessness, you have to share every detail every time. If you don't, the other parties cannot make up their own minds. That is not allowed in a blockchain, and that makes this quite slow. Way too slow for many purposes, and that's being researched right now. How the mind sharing of computers can be restricted to where it makes sense, but it's not solved. 
And there should be something like I'm just asking you, just trust me. Because it doesn't matter right now. But check it out later. And maybe because you felt what I said before made sense, you believe me now. And going forward, for now, assume this might be true. Maybe you only check back the checks, maybe here and there. And do rely on your peers in the audience to find me out the other times. If everyone fact-checks something, then on the whole, that should mean everything is fact-checked. And if something is wrong, Peter Todd will sound it wrong. <laughs> and that's actually one approach to scale the blockchain. And again, it looks quite human, what is going on there, and you wonder if that is coincidental. Now, just very briefly, not in detail, what is a smart contract? A smart contract is basically when you let a program run this way. It runs on all computers at the same time. All computers do the exact same thing and come to the same result, ideally. So they all agree what the results of the program is. And when that program can move virtual currency from one virtual account to another, then all computers in the node will agree that it did that. And that money will effectively have moved. The implications of that are huge. But it basically allows to create virtual currencies, fully automated markets that work somewhat like stop-loss stock exchange bots. And it cuts out middlemen that make a living by providing markets with trust. Intermediaries who provide escrow, money transfer, banking. It will enable new forms of wealth, jobs, and opportunities to create real value. So here's a question that's super important. I get asked that a lot, and it's fair to ask that in every context where people talk about blockchain. What is a blockchain needed for in IoT? This is a question many people ask, and many mistakenly believe the answer is no. But the answer is simple, and it's all about the automatic market that smart contracts allow you to create. Because what this allows us is fully automated commerce between entities that cannot trust each other without a middleman who does. And the point here is, what actually happens on the ground in IoT, with or without blockchain, you might not be able to discern. Because how does a highway look different in a dictatorship or in a democracy? It doesn't. How does a ship look different? It does not. Or a plane? It doesn't. Buildings look the same in a democracy or in a dictatorship. So what is it? The point is, democracy has a very complex overhead. It requires institutions, procedures, process. And there's a lot of negotiation going on when you don't have a central command. But therefore, for many things, this is much more efficient and sustainable for humans. And these negotiations are what the blockchain can do for IT. It's not the actual action. Whatever these things actually do then, once they've concluded what they want to do together, once things are worked out, that is the same as before. But it's about who has the control. And it's all not too hard when you go for a centralized command. But as we have seen, that is often too rigid for growth. And to make something possible that were not possible before, empowering devices to be part of the democracy of And why would we want that? Well, there are many reasons. Trust, agency, sustainability. If we talk about smart contracts, smart cities, and buildings, there's a little anecdote. This building there, people in Florence forgot when it was actually built, when he thought it was from the times of the Romans, as old as the Pantheon in Rome. In fact, it wasn't. It was built only a 1,000 years ago, not 2,000 years. Can we imagine that a smart building that is run by a centralized company could last that long? Or shouldn't we find a way to make the smart components of a building decentralized and not depending on a single entity? Then maybe we will be able to build something that can last as long as these buildings. Will we be able to achieve this kind of sustainability? Or will we need to build things that are self-sustained and resilient 
and can take part in the ever-changing song and dance around them out of their own accord. Reprogrammable for certain, just like new paint will be necessary every now and then on concrete, but everything that is in bronze and marble will just need a little shine. How about building software that is that powerful and long-living to accommodate things that are with us, often so much longer than a generation or two? Right, I'm closing.